Hello, welcome to B2. We'll get started shortly. Well, everyone's a pleasant surprise, but Shoshana even more so. It's nice to see new faces as well as people I don't know. I am much more surprised by other people than by seeing myself, that much I can tell you. The beginning of our playtime together. Let's um, keep this um, always looking for new opportunities to be creative. So the, the God of creativity is on our side today because I had to be in a different meeting and the internet went out in my neighborhood. So I figured if I had to use my work phone to hotspot, this was the place to be. So I've kind of snuck out of my other duties. But if you won't tell, I won't tell. And here we are. So thank you for your uh, session this morning, Sheila. A good start. So many complicated issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So it's a very complex issue. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> but uh, I'm getting to know a lot of new initiatives uh, and I'm just delighted to be part of this conference. Hmm. Yeah, complicated, complex, confusing, but let's be collaborative and creative. And I'm running out of all the words I know that begin with the letter C in English. Hmm. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna uh, suggest we get started. I have started the recording al already. Let's see if it's saying that. Yes, it is. Uh, so. Um, welcome to uh, B2, uh, the, the title of which is um, Interhub, uh, and uh, it's all about intergenerational, intergenerative, and transdisciplinary future, futuring. Um, now, uh, in just a second, I'm going to ask each one of you to introduce yourselves um, by sharing um, something about where your feet hit the ground or your roots or where, where you came from and what you aspire to do, uh, two things in this session or in the whole conference or in your lives in general. Um, sticking, if we can, to this notion of learning and the future. Now, um, I already said to those of you who joined early that um, we're doing, trying to do this a little playfully. So I, this is about relational learning. So I wanna set the stage by saying, that um, I'm going to be replaced by a relative, uh, a relation. Um, so uh, the What in the World Wednesday's Towers group um, gave, gave me support in actually changing my name for you. So I'm going to perform or, or I'm going to facilitate or I'm going to navigate by um, my, my performance character whose name ironically is Silly or Sylvanus. Sylvanus is named for the Roman god of forests and their boundaries, who, and he asks human beings, what can we learn about health from our relations, the trees and forests? So he's a transdisciplinary boundary spanning artist. Um, and I guess uh, in order to set the stage, I should wear my tree doctor hat, Get one of my younger relatives in the picture. Oh, he's not in the picture. He, she, they is not in the picture. And get my forest green stethoscope. So, all right. So Peter Whitehouse did not show up. Sylvanus or Silly showed up to talk about Inderhub. And now let me, rather than doing a land acknowledgement, which I think is so appropriate to consider doing in this uh, time, welcome you to a space-time probability field. In many ways, this is a celebration of the larger context in which we find land, and that is the context of the universe that we all find ourselves in. And that's not to diminish uh, the dangers and challenges of colonization that have gone on and why we should make land acknowledgements, but the, part, the point of this future piece is to try to contextualize human beings and trees 
what we can learn from each other in this space um, that is celebrating uh, an initiative that we have been doing now for two years called Interhub. And I will tell you more about Interhub interspersed with the stories you're about to share. So um, trees demonstrate two tropisms, two movements towards, two growth. Geotropism, their roots seek out gravity. And phototropism, their, 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 uh, their leaves seek out illumination. So it's in that spirit of uh, saying something about your roots, where you find yourself right now, and something about where you aspire to contribute to the larger picture of the evolution of our species, other species, the planet, and the universe. So there's a twofold question, your roots and your aspirations. Your, what, what, what roots grounds you in gravity and what you aspire to be illuminated by. Um, hopefully that's enough of a broad prompt that uh, we'll just, let's see, we always decide how many, we've got 10 people. Um, why don't we do it if people don't mind the memory game? And if uh, somebody forgets who's gone, just ask people who haven't spoken to raise their hand. So I will have um, the uh, pleasure of picking on the first person who will then ask another person, ask another person, ask another person. Now we have an hour together. Um, so these introductions um, will um, create some um, uh, time uh, that uh, can go on for the whole time as far as I'm concerned, except it'd be nice to see if we could find how all these trees relate to each other. So looking for common themes, seeing what we're gonna take out of the session explicitly that it results from the collective being together. Does that sound okay to anybody, everybody? Um, any strong objections wanting to switch the metaphor away from trees or? <laughs> okay, <laughs> then um, I am gonna pick on Shahana, Shoshana uh, and ask uh, her to tell her where you're grounded and where, where you aspire. <clears throat> okay. Um, I love your concept of characters and because it reminds me of my clowning and in clowning, there's no judgment and you play fully present. So I'm gonna take on that spirit and uh, because there's no right answer or best answer. So I'll start by saying my grounding is in a very long, deep wisdom tradition of being available for service of a higher order or a higher um, calling and having compassion interweave with that. And my illumination comes from play. It also comes from compassion and wisdom. And it comes from a deep hope that my ability to develop myself as a person will never be too far behind the plans that are unfolding serendipitously of where it is that the intersection between what I'm learning and what I'm meant to do live. Um, and that could be academic learning, it, it could be real world learning, but forever relational and hopefully with lots of joy. Thank you. And can you pass on to another box person? Okay. I am going to pass on to Charlene, who I had the pleasure of meeting this morning briefly. Okay. I'm going to see if I understand the directives well. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, I guess um, thinking about what, what grounds me, you know, in my, my tradition, there's a universal energy of, of mother love. And one of her dwelling places is in the forest because that's where she collects the leaves to heal. So um, I do a lot of work with young people. So I think that energy grounds me and I have her symbol all around my house and my office. Um, and I see myself going into the symbolic academic forest and collecting um, the leaves to heal some of the damage that education has done. 
So what illuminates me is um, this service, the service of honoring this universal energy and the service of um, seeing the power of young people and to see, and I'm so excited when the young people are the seedlings that teach me. So I will call on Lynn Clear. You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute. I was just trying to find the right button. <laughs> it's late here. It's I've had a long day. <laughs> so, my seed, the seed of my soul, my being that called me into existence. And you might hear that I was American grounded in the US. Um, what what allows me to grow that seed of love in the world is wrapped around my values. And the first being health, and that's my health, because I know that if I'm not healthy, I can't even be present in this space. So health, um, interconnectedness, understanding, acceptance, replacing tolerance, and compassion. And what you use the tomb illumination, what lightens me up and what keeps me going is my sense of humor. It's um, when things get hopeless, if we can still retain our ability to laugh. And so my, everything that I do revolves around uh, the priority of remembering that love is the one thing that connects us all. It's the one thing that makes life meaningful to us and doing that, investing my lifetime into that, um, understanding systems, understanding how the universe works and how we are the universe, uh, co-creating all, all that's meant to be and making a positive and powerful difference in the world. So I'm grateful to be in this space. So let me pass this on to Elizabeth. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I channeled you, <laughs> Lynn Claire. Oh, God, Thank, so you so Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I I feel like I was uh, I'm I, I feel like I have a more utilitarian message here or something to share, which is okay. Um, I'm lucky enough to work alongside Shoshana many times in throughout the day. <laughs> And so I get to uh, attest to her, her powers and her deep connectedness to um, always uh, supporting and sharing and, and, and I get to bask in her energy. So that's, uh, that's a wonderful thing. And, and you're here now. So that's, that's excellent. Shoshana, of course you would be. So, so I, I can say that, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll talk about right now and, and, of course, it, it, in the context of, uh, of many years of working alongside older adults with dementia. And right now I'm doing a lot of um, teaching and trying to excite students about, about the field. I feel like it is my, uh, I was born to do it. It makes me immensely happy when I see that spark, when I, when I can share the, the deep knowledge that their heart is beating and they themselves will be an older person. <laughs> And I think that if I can, if I can get, um, if I can pass that along, if I can ignite that in someone uh, through um, supporting them and, and getting them to, to understand um, life in all its complexity and its wonderfulness, then I've, I've done a good job and it makes me incredibly happy. Um, yeah, so so I think um, I, I I I I've heard um, is it uh, Lynn Claire talk about the interconnectedness that you know um, young people think about uh, hopefully the the planet the the future and they um, the ones that I'm around are less likely to understand that their role in the context of overtime and how they can generate positivity and, and contribute. So, um, so that's, that's what keeps me going and it excites me deeply. And, and yeah, so I'm, I'm 
thrilled to be here and meet you all. So thank you so much. So I'm going to, is it Thomas or, or Thomas? Thomas. I'm gonna, Thomas, okay. I'm going to pass, pass it along. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm in New Zealand, so it's 6 a.m. Uh, and it's lovely to be in this session. Uh, I suppose what grounds me is um, having meaningful relationships. Uh, I'm, I work at a university, AUT University in Auckland, New Zealand, and I have belonged to a critical tourism studies network and lots of interesting networks with wonderful people. And what keeps me going are, are these wonderful relationships with other human beings around the world uh, who are wanting to change the world for the better, uh, who are very playful, creative, and it's this interconnectedness and the possibility of, of doing things with students in the classroom um, and with other human beings that um, I find really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I am more of a, disobedient, playful academics. So, so always look for <laughs> other ways of doing things. Um, and, and for this reason, I'm attracted to, to this conference and, and to the people in this conference. Uh, so exploring new opportunities, uh, having fun, having joy, being playful, uh, finding ways of being meaningful in the classroom as well, um, and authentic. Um, those are the things that um, I look for. And I will invite Paul to share his views. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Greetings from an Australian in Washington, D.C. to New Zealand. You did beat us again in the rugby, so... Um, <laughs> you're, um, no, I, I'm, I'm operating. I'm talking to you from, um, from my AmeriCorps office here. Maybe you can see. Maybe you can't. This is where, I, this is where I'm sort of currently where I work. I, I work with an AmeriCorps program in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. And I have uh, 16 volunteers working with the neediest kids in the school system in after school programs or school programs. So that's kind of where my feet land right now where I'm talking to you. Um, and service is a big part of staying real in the work that, that we do. In fact, uh, one of my members and myself put together a video for this conference. I'm a Taos associate and have been associated with it for a long time. But there's a pro if, if anyone's interested in some of the uh, social emotional learning work that we do here at AmeriCorps, there's a video on the, available on the conference uh, website. But um, I guess beyond that though, deeper than that is the grounding and, and where the Taos Institute is so important to me with Ken and his work is that my grounding is in story and the work of Michael White and David Epstein from way, way, way back um, before we lost Michael White. You know, Michael, Australian guy, he started narrative therapy. Michael's a good friend and a good mentor. So uh, my work, I, I run the Center for Narrative Studies, which is storywise.com. Um, story has been my be all and end all. And I've worked in international programs in Israel, Palestine, Africa, South Africa, Ireland. That's been my theory of change. Um, so that sort of, and I love the Ta Taos Institute and the Taos community are just some of the most amazing people, such an international group. I just love any chance I get to, to mingle with them. And my aspirational, um, I live in Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, politics is our blood sport here. You know, the, it's like the Colosseum in Rome, <laughs> gladiators and the lions. And, uh, you know, one week the lions win and one week the gladiators win. So right now I'm kind of either threatening to find a little island somewhere off the coast and build a monastery and get some cows and milk the cows and make cheese and grow some, some grapes and make wine. I, I, I've always wanted to change the world, but now I'm sort of, I want more choices. I want some alternate worlds. I, I want some alternate worlds. I just don't think the system is just driving me nuts and it's driving people crazy. And I, I'm looking for, my aspirational thing is, I don't know, maybe I want to find another tree or find another heaven, or sing John Lennon and sit in, in Central Park with a guitar and sing Imagine or something. I don't know. I'm looking for an alternate world, not a different world, because I don't think I'm, Washington, D.C. wears you out. I mean, it's a great yeah. place, but that's my... So I'm grounded in story. Service is my current professional outreach. 
Um, and my aspiration is to create, and the Taos are the, you are the people that I think together, we, we, we represent an alternate world and certainly an alternate way of thinking, which is what I love. So I'm gonna pass it on to who hasn't, Aster, have you spoken? If, if I have apologies, but Aster, are you there? And while Aster unmutes, if she's there, it might be a good idea for people to mute um, while they're not uh, talking. Uh, it's not been too bad, but occasionally like have a little glitch. Astra, are you with us? Well, um, maybe we'll wait on Aska and um, uh, Sheila, I think uh, you could go. And I think uh, uh, Katie, um, we have uh, two or three people left. So um, Sheila, are you with us? I just switch off the... Uh the video because my internet connection isn't that good right now. Um, uh, yes, um, well, uh, well, how do I say this? Uh, first of all, I've had uh, deeply experienced being uprooted. I think that's something that, uh, and that experience uh, was when I came to France around uh, the age of 25, 20, I mean, 28 really. Um, Oh, did I say 28? No, so 25, sorry. I uh, came from India and suddenly uh, I felt, uh, you know, uh, that I didn't belong to where I was, uh, you know, and uh, the desperate uh, thing was uh, that I wanted to get back, uh, but uh, didn't understand what getting back was uh, meant really, you know, whether, uh, so I think I've gone through this experience of being deeply uprooted actually from, uh, you know, where I really didn't know where I was. Having gone through that experience, I think I tried to latch on to my uh, roots or go back to understanding my own roots. And, you know, and it has been a very long process, which uh, eventually ended up grounding me in uh, myself. And uh, so I think uh, it is through a practice of meditation that I adopted uh, several years ago, uh, which is called Vipassana. And it is through Vipassana that I, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, it is Vipassana that has grounded me and has given me the roots uh, to understand my own self and my connections uh, with uh, the oneness uh, that we are in. And so ever since, uh, so I, I feel I'm really grounded in there, in that um, understanding of self and connecting uh, in any which way that uh, the present moment offers to me to connect, uh, you know, and therefore right now I'm happy connecting with, uh, uh, with all of you. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, and what I aspire for is to be, uh, is to really, I don't like to make it sound like a cliche, but uh, be the change uh, that I want for the world. And so uh, in a way, in this oneness uh, that uh, we are all part of, uh, basically uh, my aspiration uh, is, um, I like the term of striving to be nobody because it's that's when I, I can, um, that's where that's a possibility for as an aspiration. I mean, that's the possibility that I can one day really experience this oneness. Uh, you know, that's the only way I can experience it. So uh, it's I won't hide, uh, you know, behind the fact that uh, this word I'm striving to be nobody. I have taken from uh, the title of a certain um, monk who has written this uh, book and uh, which uh, inspired me. But um, yeah, and today, since you've asked me the question, uh, I think that's what, uh, you know, I want to be able to experience this oneness uh, uh, for the time being, everything that uh, I, uh, um, you know, I mean, much of, uh, all that we say and we talk about is an experience of duality uh, and uh, it's not that experience of oneness. So what I am aspiring for is the experience and therefore striving to be nobody. Thank you. And so can I pass on now? Um, uh, what about Paul? Has Paul spoken? Yes, I've spoken, so. Uh, yeah, Paul has spoken. So I think that leaves only with 
with Asta, doesn't it? I think there's only Asta who remains. Yeah. Asta yeah. And, and Kathy, I think, right? Or has Kathy been? Yep, nope, nope. So we got two. Asta, if she's here. Asta, um, Interhub calling Asta. Okay, I, then I think, uh, Kathy, if you can um, share your um, roots and aspirations, and then we will go to putting our roots together, maybe seeing where we our illumination uh, combines. And I will say a word about what Interhub is, uh, just so you have a sense of uh, fulfilling that learning objective, not that I believe in them, but anyway, Kathy. I would say currently, um, I would, um, say that my roots are grounded in my adult children and my two incredible granddaughters who really are soul food for me and they fuel me and feed me with joy and hope daily. Um, from more of a professional context as a therapist and an, a university instructor, I would say I'm really moving and grounded in relational curiosity, creativity, and compassion. And what inspires me is the hope to, to continue to ignite curiosity and creativity, lateral kindness and compassion um, with those that I have the good fortune to, to walk beside on the planet. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so um, Interhub, your host, if you will, um, has um, a um, roots and it has aspirations. Um, the roots start with um, my alter ego, Peter Whitehouse. Now this is Silvana speaking. Of course, I'm having a hard time doing that because it's really me and myself but uh, who's a geriatric neurologist who was fortunate to marry a developmental psychologist uh, who now has four grandkids and who used to play rugby. Uh, so I'm just actually trying to make a few connections here and loves Australia and New Zealand, by the way. Um, but anyway, in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm grounded, my wife and I started three public intergenerational schools um, where people with dementia, my patients would come to school and learn with kids, uh, not just people with dementia, people with all kinds of cognitive challenges. So the idea was, was to create public schools where um, age uh, uh, is, is part of the background and it's part of the, the learning experiences. The signature program was storytelling, Paul, sharing stories from books or, uh, or from their own lives and to develop relations uh, so that these were not just one-off experiences that the elders and the kids got together. The mission of the school, and they have been successful, three of them, was a lifelong learning, uh, kind of a no-brainer for a, uh, a, uh, a school, intergenerational school, but spirited citizenship. And I heard a lot of spirit from this group in many ways. And, and we put, it's a public school, so we put the word spirited to get spirit into the, the mission of a public school. Uh, but I think that, that that notion of service, that notion of the collective um, is built into this school. So this is, uh, this is the, the the roots of, of Interhub, the intermedium was Intergenerational Schools International. So I got uh, uh, to know, know some of you um, from my experiences in Canada, where I work at Baycrest, where I think some, some of the others of you have experience. Uh, and we've uh, worked in a number of different places uh, in Canada, in the UK, to try to uh, stimulate um, this intergenerational relationships in uh, service of, um, uh, of the community. I'm an academic, I work at a number of different universities, so I'm also work, working on restructuring universities. Okay, that's the past. Now what happened? Well, I became a tree doctor, um, COVID occurred. Um, I get, I've become increasingly concerned about the climate crisis. So in terms of the many changes I've had in my career as a healer, from clinician to public health, to ethics, to um, now, arts and humanities, um, I, I, just, I, I just, like many of you, um, wanted a different way of thinking of myself as a person and a healer. And I think the crisis of our relationship to nature has been huge. And so trees are obviously, even the prime minister of the UK said they're the lungs of the planet. So that obviously they're biologically important, they're metaphorically important. 
And also, if you write the history of, of the civilization, or for that matter, from human beings coming out of trees and descending onto the plains, our relationships to forests have been culturally really important. Storytelling, Epic of Gilgamesh, first written narrative we have, uh, the story about the relationships with forests and human mortality. Um, and whether it's paper, masts, burning them, which we're doing today, uh, our relationships to forest tell us a lot about who we are as people and civilizations. So Interhub got organized in something that I commend to your attention, the Presencing Institute. I'll put that in the chat in a minute, but you can Google Presencing Institute, comes out of the MIT uh, Center for Organizational Learning, probably Peter Senge is a name many of you have heard who focus on organizational learning. Otto Scharmer and a whole team of people have created a digital space in which Interhub is one of the components of a project called Gaia, Global Activation of Intention and Action. And uh, it's all about transforming civilization. And my transdisciplinary friends who have worked with us over the years have given uh, this uh, new phase a name. It may or may not be the name that we adopt. It's not the Anthropocene. Uh, that's the name of a geological epoch. It's Cosmodernity. I, I'm tired of talking about postmodernity. Okay, what comes next? I think it's reenchanting the world. It's bringing cosmology. It's bringing the big picture back in. And if we talk about space-time probability fields, we're either talking physics and quantum and cosmologies in that end, or we're talking about indigenous people who don't make the same distinctions about space and time and uh, have a very different conception of fields than we do. So I, I do think uh, the main imp impetus between Interhub and between the Presencing Institute is transforming civilization. Because I think an undercurrent of many things, many of what we've been talking about here and some of the things in, in Taos, we need more appreciative stories. We need more social construction. We need more relational learning. So Interhub tries to manifest that in this vast, and I mean, very embracing international uh, space, digital space called the Presencing Institute. So um, that is the past and present, I hope, of Interhub. And you would be welcome to join us. Um, but I tried in telling you the story of Interhub to interweave some of the themes that I heard from you. Uh, let me just look and see what um, I, I, we didn't include. Um, well, let me not do that. Let me turn it over to you. What else did you hear? Oh, I'll say one last thing. Trees have been deceiving us, by the way. They do seek illumination. We think of them as photosynthetic beings who adjust their leaves to capture all the energy with this branching structure that we have adopted as trees of knowledge and trees of, of speciation. I mean, the tree metaphor is a, above the ground has been really a powerful one. Oh, let me tell you as the tree doctor, the real metaphor, the real action about trees is underground. It is all the interdigitated roots and interactions with other species. This is not, of course, to say that the above ground seeking illumination is important. The trees really do say, in ways that we had no idea until maybe the indigenous people did. They communicate, they share, they, they do intergenerational work under the ground. So um, let's look for those entangled roots uh, of, of this conversation and see what emerges out of that uh, towards um, our mutual interest in um, relational learning. So I hope that, that serves as a brief uh, synopsis of your host. Any questions, of course, of what I said would be welcome. And I will put a few of these things in the chat as you guys start taking uh, some turns now sharing um, what you want to share. Peter, can I ask a clarifying question, please? Mm -hmm. Could you? What is the relationship between Interhub and the intergenerational schools? Is that the same project umbrella? <clears throat> um, so, I, I went through this rather quickly. Intergenerational schools became Intergenerational Schools International, uh, which was a nonprofit. And I got tired of dealing with educational bureaucracies and then COVID came and the Presencing Institute uh, became uh, a space where Intergenerational Schools International, ISI, 
became Interhub. It's not an organizational connection. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a journey, if you will. I hope that helps. And remember the two key words in the Interhub are intergenerational and intergenerative, a word we made up, which I can explain if you wish, and transdisciplinary. So you all come from different disciplines, different, um, uh, different, different ages. That's nice to see some age diversity here. Um, those are the themes in Interhub. I'll speak. Can I say something? Yes, please just jump in. At this point, just jump in. Yeah, I just want to say what attracted me to this to this conversation for this dialogue tonight was is around all those things that we've just been talking about. And first of all, it was the word futuring, because so much of what we, I've been hearing, what we've been listening to, is about the past, and to be to stand it's important to of course to remember the past but to stand in the present moment and to anticipate our future not to expect anything but that anticipation and it's it's the ing um, that really excited me about what you're doing um, peter and the intergenerative aspect um, i'm sure you remember the tony award-winning um, production. I saw Jack Klugman and Ozzie Davis in I'm Not Rappaport in New York in 1986. It won the Tony, or the, is it Tony or Emmy? I can't remember. And the last line, the line that just, I've never forgotten it, was when Jack Klugman turned to Ozzie Davis and said, do you know what growing old in America is? Do you know this line, Peter? He said, growing old in America is abortion at the other end of life. And my work has been transdisciplinary. And it's been, you know, the greatest teachers are, are the children. And, you know, we've earned these white hairs, I hope, of wisdom. And I'm doing a project through the nameless, I'm, I'm interviewing people about what they remember so they can help us anticipate and, and, and be ready in this moment because there is no such thing as now. The minute I say now, it, it's gone, it's in the abyss. So the wisdom of the sages, the grandfathers reflecting on their life and synchronicity, synchrone, C-R-O-N-E, S-I-N-G, the songs of the grandmothers you know, teaching, working with young people, it's so exciting. And it's, I have a, you know, you're talking about the having people who with memory issues. I lost my mom to Alzheimer's and having um, a near eidetic memory is a real pain. It's painful when you have a mother who doesn't know you and then starts time traveling and thinks that you're her and you know how lucky your dad is to have both of you. So it's blessings for what you're doing. I'm really excited about it. Um, I look forward to staying connected to a lot of the people that are here because futuring is in our, that's what we're doing right here in this moment. That connection, thank you. Thank you, yeah, I like ING, I like doing things, not just the future, but futuring. Absolutely. Uh, other uh, reflections, thank you, Lynn Claire. I, I love the idea. Um, it reminds me, I don't know, you may have, Homo Prospectus, Seligman's recent book. That's a few years old now, but it's about shifting this whole idea. It's the future, not the past. The Professor future. Pop Pop and the two princes. Oops. I'm, um, putting, I'm putting a video link in the chat. My apologies, and I hadn't muted. Uh, so I, there are now, um, there, there will be um, a few links in the, in the, in the, um, in the chat for you, sorry. Go ahead, Paul, my apologies. 
No, just saying it's an interesting area of research around probably flipping psychology and psychotherapy on its head, really, in terms of that. I love the saying, there's more of the future in the present than there is in the future. I love that whole idea. And then, the, and the you, you know, the work that you're talking about, uh, the Presencing Institute, what is what in the what in the what is what of the future is in the present and what could we build on in terms of I think that's really powerful my car I'm writing a book hopefully coming out in Christmas my work with students here in uh, Montgomery County around I, I'm really interested and concerned about how they're making taking the past of COVID into their future as memory how do we do that because um, the school system here is just intent on let's get back to normal let's test the kids see how far behind they are and just roll it roll it roll it and this whole thing about someone I was on a call this morning, someone said, you know, the kids have come back on survival brain and we've got to switch them to relating brain. Mm. And until we switch them to relating brain, they won't get into learning brain. And I thought, wow, that's really pertinent to what this whole Taos conference mm. is about. But the, the creating of memories that won't haunt, haunt us or hurt us. But how do we create memories that will heal us? And that's what this, this book is about and the work that I'm concerned about in terms of memory as a, a com collaborative community making process that's so important. Can I interject something about uh, trees that I heard recently, a, a podcast on the CBC that I think is relevant to this, although I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I just heard one podcast on it, but it was an interview with somebody named Suzanne um, Simard. Um, she's a forester, I'm sure. Oh, she's a professor at UBC now, but she, um, her, her uh, experience as a forester got her to, to interested in, in this communication that goes on under the ground, this connection, this interdependency of species. Peter, I'm sure you can speak much more eloquently about this. I, I just, I just heard this interview and I'm going to get her book, but she developed this um, idea with a mother tree and um, the, as a hub of, of communication uh, uh, and how species of trees that we just clear cut how they need one another in order to survive and that they are, you know, we're interfering with these lines of communication and relationships that have devastating consequences. I, I just thought it was an awesome uh, interview and she sounded amazing and I, Peter, do you, do you have anything that you could share about that? Absolutely. Thinking. Her work, okay. her work um, which as you might expect in a um, male driven, um, yeah. industry driven uh, field um, was very slow to be accepted. Um, yeah. The idea that um, it's not just all Darwinian survival of the fit that fittest yeah, actually yeah. is um, the collaboration between species that we see more evidence of perhaps under the ground, mm -hmm. and I think that's an absolutely important lesson from the from the trees, which is um, if if we um, and by the way we've written a new book too about how our current mm -hmm. political and economic systems of male dominated neoliberalism essentially impair our brain health. So we're, we're in the process of reinventing dementia uh, as a field, I hope, uh, to get away from this. Notion. That's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, but it, the point is, <clears throat> you know, there's a balance we all have to find between cooperation and competition. Um, mm. But if we don't figure out how to cooperate and uh, uh, seek the whole and and, uh, mm. and and celebrate the interconnections, not the differences. Uh, you know, it's going to be a really ironic story written in the Encyclopedia of the Universe that the species that, and I can't speak for dolphins because they've got pretty good brains looking, looking at them, the, the species that seems to have the best ability to um, see the big picture and to see their roles and that, that consciousness, um, which I think we have to recognize we share with other creatures. We're not, you know, human exceptionalism mm -hmm. should be dead. But if we don't recognize that collective, that solidarity, we're going to go extinct. And and it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, we're gonna say, whoa, that was a species that tried hard, but they really didn't uh, learn all the lessons they could from from their animal nature and their plant nature. The two doctor says. Can I? I I just have a question for. Um... Uh, you know, um, I have uh, 
uh, been reading quite a few uh, American educationists who uh, are very inspired by uh, Maturana because he has, uh, in particular, with his theory, uh, you know, Santiago theory of cognition, uh, among others, which I have read about. My question to you is, uh, you know, is, uh, for example, Maturana's theories, are they uh, in any way uh, explored, studied, et cetera, in, uh, in the US uh, universities, or are these just rare uh, cases of people who get inspired by something that's coming from, let's say, from the South and, uh, and talk about it? Is, uh, you know, how much has it got into mainstream uh, university education? I'm gonna ask Charlene the comment because I was interpreting her her, her trunk nodding is saying, no, no, she has something to say. What, what do you say? Uh, can you answer that question? Well, I'm not familiar, you know, with the Santiago theory of cognition, but I think, you know, because I am a professor in the Department of Education, and it's, it's very frustrating that we continue to reproduce the same thing in terms of what learning is. So, I mean, you know, there's this ideology of that, you know, we have to understand the sameness, but we have to understand that in a historical context as well. Um, and so, you know, I wish that we would have these um, different modalities of teaching that happens in the public schools and embrace that. If anything, things are getting more conservative in the schools with a mandate that you cannot talk about you know, you have to make certain students feel comfortable. That's literally what people are saying, that you can't integrate certain global concepts because some students will feel uncomfortable. So I think as an education system, we're going backwards. So, I mean, that's one of my impetus in joining this community because I didn't think many people would look like me or have ideologies I have, but I wanted to expand my own thinking and be here. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's very scary in the US because we're actually going backwards. Um, that's my comment. <laughs> yeah, the title of our book is American Dementia, Brain Health. And the American Dementia is the cultural dementia that Charlene just described. Mm -hmm. And clearly the fight, the fight over our schools is, um, is a real issue. I would invite our, our colleagues from down under. Uh, New, New Zealand, um, has had a particularly, I think, um, relatively healthy relationship to uh, the Maori and indigenous peoples. And um, uh, the, the teachings, uh, so the, the, I'm, going to, I'm going to say to you, no, no, no the, the Southern hemisphere are, you know, people who, who, who uh, torment us at the borders. They're not Huala Freire, they're not these new conceptions of how, so, I mean, yes, we are, we are really insular in that regard. But let's listen to, um, if, if, if Thomas is willing, the evolution of the relationship between the Maori and um, uh, I forget what they call you guys. Um, the Akiha. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to me that, that, to me maybe there's some lessons there about how we can bring some of these ideas, not just from the South, South America, but from indigenous peoples around the world. Yeah, I'm happy to comment. I'm not an expert in this, so I just want to make sure that people don't think that um, I've got the authority to comment on, on those relationships. But um, as an observer, I'm originally European, so you can tell I have an accent and, and I was born in the Czech Republic, Czechia, um, and I came to New Zealand about 20 years ago. So um, for me, um, I can see, um, I, I suppose, perceive different culture cultures. I can also see how uh, indigenous people have been treated around the world and um, how the relationship has unfolded in New Zealand. And from my perspective, um, I, I think there's far more cooperation and willingness on part of the people, the government, the institutions to include indigenous voices. Uh, so, for example, at our university and, and other universities and institutions in New Zealand, uh, there's real willingness, I suppose, and push to uh, include Maori ways of thinking and doing um, and, and embedding the notions of reciprocity, relationships, uh, consultation um, with the indigenous populations. 
Um, and I think that has um, created um, a far better outcome for the peoples in New Zealand. That said, I think it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, that there are still challenges and issues. Um, but what I would like to maybe point out, because uh, there is this uh, focus on nature. Um, the, in New Zealand, we have um, recognitions of mountains, for example, uh, to, to be enjoying the same sort of legal uh, bonds as human beings. So, so Manuel Pehu um, is protected and, and legally it's got almost the same um, uh, traits as human beings. So, so the law is protecting natural monuments. And I think that's because of the interconnectedness of the indigenous peoples to nature. Mm -hmm. And they recognize the uh, importance of um, the natural elements. Uh, there is a um, wairu, our spirit, uh, that is penet penetrating every everything natural. Uh, and I think from that um, arises this um, real respect and connection with um, the natural environment. Um, and I suppose that has penetrated more into the consciousness of the New Zealand society as well, um, if you like. So, so for us, it's an ongoing conversation. And sometimes I, I, I do resonate with um, Shalina as well. I think it's a dangerous thing to make students comfortable um, in, instead of having real conversations and challenging students and making them uncomfortable uh, because I think it is from that space that you can create positive change. So, um, yeah, these are just a few of my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, so let me welcome um, Dr. Priya Lakshmi. Um, we're talking about um, the future, futuring rather, and um, what we can learn from our roots, including the roots of uh, our human species. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, say we have from by my watch about eight minutes left. So I, I, I ask anybody who has something to contribute that brings us together, um, that makes us a forest, not individual trees. Um, and I'm gonna offer one thing, cause I alluded to it before. Um, Taos is about social construction. And I actually have challenged Taos to say it's not just social construction about human beings. That is too self-centered. So I've actually suggested eco-psychosocial reconstruction where we think of what does it mean to create a planet where we, we have trees be part of the communication pattern that allows us to construct things that are, that are, that are uh, perhaps helpful for the future. But the word intergenerativity, which is part of the inner hub, is a word that summarizes a lot of what we've been saying here. It's a new word. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, generativity, I love it, lovely word, Eric Erickson and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Intergenerativity means you take sources of generativity and put them together, <clears throat> like intergenerational. But I put the definition in um, mm -hmm. because a lot of us talked about connectivity and a lot of us talked about future. Intergenerativity means going between, all of us going between, to go beyond. So I invite you to um, celebrate um, inventing words playfully, but with serious intent, intergenerativity. So now that you've learned a word, anybody got any intergenerative comments to make? <clears throat> and, and I'm gonna invite Charlene to uh, speak from the, well, one of my big problems is I'm a privileged white male, older white male, and I should be going extinct. And I will personally fairly soon. So, you know, not, not to worry on that end, but how do we create intergenerative conversations that invite uh, a di more diverse group of people than just me and my friends? Well, I think, I think Taos is doing it. I mean, we're having people from, you know, around the world um, coming to talk about this whole idea of how do we create this future now? You know, I, I think that's good. Um, I think there has to be a vulnerability and, and talking about the things that don't work. And there has to be, as the privileged white man, you know, how do you bring in the indigenous voice? How do you invite those who are not always at the table um, to be in dialogue and, and learn for, with them? Um, you know, and, and one of the primary issues is that we can't 
not include what happened in the past as a structural thing. So let's not talk about it and let's just focus on the now. And that is part of the generative uh, aspect of, of connectedness is to see someone in their historical context and to invite that into the conversation and those crevices of uncomfort um, because those things makes us who we are. So I, I, I do think that, you know, I mean, I'll be, I'll be very honest, you know, as a Haitian woman, you know, um, living in America, you know, some of these conversations for me is, is around, well, okay, but we have to have some resolution. We have some, have some common language of how did we get here? And when we understand how we got here, then we can like work together and begin to weave the roots. As an educator, I often thought if the student got, and the professor or the teacher got uncomfortable, hey, that's a good opportunity for learning, not, not one to avoid because somehow you don't want to hear about what your ancestors did. Others, um, and I, I have to stop the recording uh, before we go back to the main room, otherwise we somehow lose it. So um, I'll do that about a minute before we go. So if you want your comments recorded, you better do it in the next four minutes because we only have about four and a half left. I just want to say something, you know, Charlene, I so appreciate your perspective. You know, being an American, living abroad for the last 21 years, it's been kind of watching from afar. And everything in my life, my seed, that seed of love has, has grown into a tree that it's now time to bear fruit. And that fruit is to understand that unity occurs through diversity. Without diversity, there is no unity. And I've got a book, a thousand page, a million words to describe the snowflake on the tip of an iceberg that demonstrates the truth in this, that it is true. And I think my intention coming out of this brilliant session, Paul, I'm so grateful as a transdisciplinary scientist for 30 years is my intention is that we white haired and all ages that there's intergenerational that we become the regeneration that we become willing to lead the transformation and that it becomes a grassroots movement that nobody can extinguish because they never know where it's going to pop up thank you I think the word regeneration, there's now a great regeneration movement, hugely important. Yep. Re <laughs> and by the way, re-indigeneity, um, not only decolonizing our minds, yes. but also re-indigenizing ourselves or re-naturalizing ourselves. Sorry to go on with a bunch of words, but um, sometimes, you know, just introducing these words, changing from climate change to climate crisis. It's all about creating words that create narratives. Um, uh, uh, Paul, um, can you tell us a story that summarizes everything we've said? Um, uh, but, but you know, you can say so much. We're not a, we're not a data driven, you know, and, and the, the brain scientists who think they're going to improve education will just continue to destroy it. It's, it we've got to tell stories of uh, a different way of thinking about things. I guess I got to stop the break, uh, the recording, and we're going to leave the breakout room here. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you everyone. So much.